Hartwell. Hello there. I'm Hartwell Broussard and I welcome you to HELP, the program with HELP and a request for HELP. The reason HELP is needed is because America is in distress. If you notice in the background, the American flag is displayed upside down. When a flag is displayed upside down, it is done so as a distress signal. If you wish to confirm that, go to the United States Code, Title 36, Chapter 10, Paragraph 176A. My goal is to help you to understand why America is in distress. And hopefully you will do something to help get us out of this dire situation that we are in. For this program, I will be showing you the final part of the video entitled Global Warming or Global Governance. It gets real good, people. Here is where the rubber meets the road. Please pay attention. During the sixth conference of the parties for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change held at The Hague in 2000, former French President Jacques Chirac made a startling proclamation. He said, quote, for the first time, humanity is instituting a genuine instrument of global governance, one that should find a place within the World Environment Organization which France and the European Union would like to see established. By acting together, by building this unprecedented instrument, the first component of an authentic global governance, we are working for a dialogue of peace. Global governance goes far beyond climate change, however. As Phyllis Schlafly, founder and president of Eagle Forum, has determined, it extends into every aspect of our society through treaties and agreements within the United Nations and other international institutions. All these treaties are dangerous attacks on American freedoms, national security, land ownership, and private property. Every one of these treaties involves setting up a new global bureaucracy that would have some kind of obnoxious control over American citizens, or our families, or our schools, or our businesses, or our use of natural resources and energy, or our land. And together they add up to what is meant by global governance. Treaties are one road to global governance. United Nations conferences are another. These global conferences pretend to be democratic conventions of representatives of more than 100 nations who come together to vote for plans they all agree on. Nothing could be further from the truth. The policies are all written ahead of time, and the so-called delegates are manipulated to produce what is called consensus. The consensus is never submitted to Congress. The consensus process was so firmly planted before the meeting even began that the opening day of the conference there was consensus formed. That tells me that the United Nations is not a place for open debate. It is not a place for people to share different ideas and for freedom to reign. It is a place instead where the United Nations has an agenda and they have set the agenda beforehand and people come to the table in order to find out what their working orders, what their marching orders are, and then they are to go back home and implement what the UN's agenda is. That the consensus in Kyoto will bind us to reduce U.S. energy consumption by one-fourth, and that would have a devastating effect on America's standard of living and on the ability of U.S. wage earners to support their families. There are essentially five major problems uh, with the Global Warming Treaty. Uh, as it is now being conceived and uh, probably presented. Uh, one, there's no clear, concise science. At best, the science is contradictory, it's inconclusive, it's unclear. Second, the economic consequences. The economic consequences, we know for sure, would be disastrous, would be devastating to this country, driving industries out of this country. Uh, we would lose millions of jobs, energy costs would go up, productivity would go down, standard of living would go down. Third. If, in fact, you want to curb greenhouse gas emissions, you certainly don't do that by binding the developed nations and let all the other countries, 130 of the so-called non-developed countries, including China, India, Mexico, South Korea, and others, off. Fourth, national sovereignty. This cuts right at the heart of national sovereignty of the United States of America. We, in essence, if we signed this treaty, would be saying we would allow an international body to come in and dictate to our industries, our businesses, our people, 
what they could do and what they couldn't do. Use of what, what energy, which sources of energy, the cost of energy. And fifth, national security implications. If this treaty was signed, it would have disastrous implications on our national security. It would mean that we would have to fly less. Uh, we would shut down many of our uh, training programs for tanks, armored vehicles, for ships, and for what? To sign this treaty. The Kyoto Protocol, for instance, to supposedly solve the global warming issue will not solve global warming. It has nothing to do with actually reducing the carbon dioxide levels in the, in the uh, Earth's atmosphere. If you know what is actually happening in that, the, the developing nations, China and Russia and so forth, are not bound by that treaty. They can continue to expand their industry, continue to pollute and so forth forever. And in fact, China is, is basically going to overtake the emissions of carbon dioxide by the United States within two years. And so no effect on those particular nations. They can continue just to increase. Only the developed nations are required to decrease. We have the issue of having to buy carbon credits from those third world nations. So it's a massive income redistribution plan to provide money for these third world nations and it will not help global warming whatsoever. Even the United Nations admits this. The roots of global governance goes well back over a hundred years. In 1966, one of the foremost and unimpeachable American historians of the 20th century, Carol Quigley, published a book entitled Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time. He spent 20 years researching this agenda and found that there was a quiet effort to create world government with a small cadre of people controlling that government. Because he agreed with the goals of the Cabal's efforts, Quigley was given access to all the records for a period of two years. On page 324 of his 1,300-page magnus opus are these troubling words. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalistic fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. These private groups, meetings and conferences still exist today under a cloud of innuendo and conspiracy. They include what is known as the Round Table which is the core of the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States, the Club of Rome, the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderbergs, and many others. Let's just take a look at one of these discussed by Charles Hodgson with CNN's World Business Today in London. Conspiracy or cozy talking shop? The Bilderberg Group is meeting in South Germany this week, at least according to the Financial Times, which says a group of powerful men and women will debate the future of the world. The paper says the steering committee of Bilderberg includes Deutsche Bank boss Josef Ackermann, Nokia CEO Jorma Olala, Daimler Chrysler's Jürgen Schremp, and outgoing World Bank President James Wolfensohn. I asked John Ronson, who has written about Bilderberg, what it really is. Bilderberg is a, is a meeting of powerful centrist industrialists and politicians. They always meet in secret once a year in a five-star hotel with golfing facilities and they've taken on the the, the image for conspiracy theorists of the, the, the fabled shadowy cabal that secretly rules the world. Are they? Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, I, well, I mean, they're a bunch of powerful people. They meet in, in secret. They say we meet in private, mm. uh, which isn't quite the same thing, is it? It's not quite the same thing. I do think that by and large, Many members of the Bilderberg Group actually see themselves in much the same way as the conspiracy theorists see them, as this shadowy cabal out to, um, if not to rule the well, world, okay, well, but to influence world events. What would, what, would, what would they see as their purpose then? I mean, presumably it's a kind of, it's a good get-together of powerful people. They don't often get a chance to meet away from the glare of the press. One could understand why they might want to have mm. a private chat. Yeah, and that's certainly got something to do with it. Uh, they, they see themselves as wise globalist centrists. They, they were set up post the Second World War by people like Dennis Healy, um, various, uh, David Rockefeller and various others. And there's, there's a degree of idealism there, isn't there? Oh, they yeah, didn't yeah, want yeah. to go to war again. I mean, oh, absolutely. They're, they're is like, that a sinister conspiracy? Well, I mean, it, it depends what side of the political spectrum you, 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 you sit on. And, and uh, you know, many of the anti-Bilderberg conspiracists uh, are right-wingers who see themselves as twigs in a tidal wave of globalization. They see themselves as nationalists. And they think the idea of a, of a, of a world government, which is what Bilderberg 
is, is into, by and large, the idea of, of a one-world community, a new world order. You know, they see that as They see themselves thing. as a government as opposed to a group of world leaders or people with influence at a global level who are talking about global issues, do they? They see themselves as, as headhunters. They'll, they'll get an up-and-coming politician who they think may be president or prime minister one day, and, and as globalist, industrialist leaders who believe that politics shouldn't be in the hands of the politicians. The globalists involved in creating world control have historically called their efforts the New World Order since the early part of the 20th century. President George H. Bush used it publicly during the first Gulf War. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. The name New World Order raised so many red flags that it was dropped almost as soon as President Bush uttered them during the first Gulf War. The Commission on Global Governance was immediately formed with the full blessing of the United Nations. Its report was released in 1994 and published its Our Global Neighborhood in 1995. The report provides a flexible set of justifications and implementation goals needed to implement global governance. The report acknowledges that the environment is key to forming global governance. It states that considerable strides have been made in creating a system of international environmental governance to achieve global sustainable development through the management of cross-border environmental disputes and protection of the global commons. Man-caused global warming fits perfectly within international environmental governance. The report recommends, quote, a carbon tax would no doubt be a valuable step forward towards a radically different system one that taxes resource use rather than employment through payroll taxes and savings. This would recognize the need to discourage excessive consumption and would stimulate employment as part of a strategy of sustainable development." Unquote. That is exactly what Al Gore and other alarmists are saying today. Somehow, they claim, more taxes are going to help our economy. Yes, I know that uh, CO2 tax is considered uh, just wildly unrealistic now, but you know, um, our pattern of financing our social programs and health and welfare programs on the backs of uh, em employ employment has outlived its uh, rationality and usefulness. See the payroll tax? Yeah, uh, re sharply reduce or eliminate, absolutely, and replace it with uh, a pollution-based tax system, principally CO2. I fully understand how uh, inaccessible that sounds in, in this, in this uh, context. I really believe that that would help our economy, help our competitiveness, and I think it would put incentives uh, in place to do the right thing. Regardless of Al Gore's assurances, making everything more expensive because of a carbon tax cannot help our economy or individual families, nor can a cap-and-trade scheme that is also promoted by Gore and other alarmists. The Congressional Budget Office warned that such efforts would be, and I quote, regressive in that poor households would bear a larger burden relative to their income than the wealthier households would." Unquote. Indeed, such a plan would be disastrous to the American people. This is exactly what historian Carol Quigley meant when he stated that, quote, in this group of globalists were persons whose lives have been a disaster to our way of life, unquote. How does this work? When he was vice president, Al Gore called it reinventing government through the creation of public-private partnerships. You have heard this phrase many times on the news, but didn't know what it really means. There are literally thousands of these public-private partnerships in the United States and around the world. The problem with public-private partnerships is that they shift decision-making from the electorate and elected officials to an unaccountable partnership of non-governmental organizations, government bureaucracies, and multinational corporations at the international, national, and local levels. Since none of these entities are elected and government bureaucracies are only marginally accountable to the electorate, the partnerships are free to impose their will on people, not unlike the feudal system, just as historian Carol Quigley said in his book, Tragedy and Hope. All of this is driven by the deliberately fabricated need for what is called sustainable development, which include things like smart growth and environmental protection. The latter includes the Kyoto Protocol to ostensibly reduce global warming but in fact allows control of our economy by international bureaucracies that will impose carbon taxes and cap and trade schemes exactly as the Commission on Global Governance and Al Gore propose. The partnerships form a neo-fascist relationship between government and corporations which creates monopolies, effectively eliminating most competition from small businesses that do not have the ability to meet the draconian regulations. Once this process is fully in place, there is no longer free market enterprise, but total economic control. 
Again, this is exactly what Carol Quigley said would happen in Tragedy and Hope. It is what is meant by global governance and the new world order. Lou Dobbs of CNN provides an excellent snapshot of how this is being done today and its terrible consequences on the middle class. Tonight, a proposal for an expanded so-called free trade zone from Alaska to uh, the tip of South America. It's a plan from the business elites, the political elites, that will cost more American jobs, cost American sovereignty, but it would fulfill the president's father's vision. Bill Tucker reports. <laughs> It's not a new idea. President Bush talked about country. it back in 1991. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause. I now know, former course, United States Trade Carter Ambassador Robert Zolick is talking about it again with renewed vigor. This time a new world order with business at the helm of trade and economic policy, advocating what he calls the Association of American Free Trade Agreements, a separate non-government entity which would include North, Central, and South America. What Zolik is really proposing here is a stealth trade agenda. It's not a national agenda. He's proposing to set up what's essentially a private organization to try to achieve what he couldn't get done uh, when he was the U.S. trade representative. Uh, and this is a business agenda. It's an agenda that goes hand in hand with the United States, Mexico, and Canada working quietly and behind the scenes to promote a common market with common deregulation for the benefit of multinational corporations. It's an agenda that so far has resulted in an increase in U.S. corporate profits of 45 percent, while wages of American workers have risen only 3 percent in the last five years. The main danger raised by Zelik's proposals is that the future of American international economic policy, which affects not only our nation's prosperity, but its national security, will be set not by the American people and their elected representatives, but by a small corporate elite that is accountable to no one but itself. Effectively surrendering the sovereignty of the United States. And as justification for trusting those who would have the authority, the argument is made that free trade promotes democracy and the welfare of the people. But Lou, one has to look no further than China to see whether that in fact is true. You know, I, I'm talking about Zolik's proposal. It's not Zolik's proposal, it's Daddy's proposal and people better understand that they mean exactly what they're saying. It's a new world order they're trying to create, and they're trying to do so uh, not only uh, without approval uh, or consent of the governed in right. this country, uh, but despite the popular will. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a straightforward assault by the elitists in this country. Robert Zolak, the architect of the Association of American Free Trade Agreements mentioned in Lou Dobbs' story, is one of the many power brokers heavily involved in advancing the new world order and global governance. In May of 2007, President Bush nominated him to be the next president of the World Bank, where he will have the quiet power to implement many of his ideas, including the new proposal advanced by President Bush at the G8 meeting in June 2007. So my proposal is this. By the end of next year, America and other nations will set a long-term global goal for reducing greenhouse gases. To help develop this goal, the United States would convene a series of meetings of nations that produced most greenhouse gas emissions, including nations with rapidly growing economies like India and China. Although the Bush climate plan is far superior than the Kyoto Protocol, it still begs the question, if the probability that increasing carbon dioxide will result in potentially tremendous benefits for mankind and the environment, why pursue the reduction of carbon dioxide at all? Could it be because it establishes a huge international bureaucracy which is not accountable to the citizens of the United States and the world? That is very, very clear in these United Nations documents that they want to set up a regulatory structure that would affect every man, woman, and child on planet Earth. And all of the control would be headquartered in the United Nations. And if we take the more recent United Nations documents, it's going to be called the Trusteeship Council in the restructure of the United Nations that's occurring right now. While these plans are being made for everyone else, those demanding that we make these sacrifices have no intention of making the same sacrifices themselves. All right, now I'd like to put up the little pledge thing here. I'm gonna ask you if you would like to commit here today. You know how many hundreds of thousands of fans you have out there that would like to follow your lead. 
And this pledge merely says, as you can read it up there, that you're agreeing to consume no more energy in your residence than the average American household by one year from today. Not right now. By You've got a whole year to, look, uh, to try to do this. Now, the one thing I'd like to have you not use in response to this question, which is a yes or no question, is the various gimmicks. Now, I have something I want to uh, submit for the record, Madam Chairman, that talks about the effects, the offsets and the credits are gimmicks used by the wealthy so they don't have to change their lifestyles. This, and I have an article that is last Sunday's United Kingdom Times. I'd like to add, uh, uh, submit for the record at this time. You may. All right. What's your answer? Purchase wind, wind, yes. wind energy uh, and other green energy that does not produce carbon dioxide. Uh, and th that does cost a little more now, and that is one of the reasons uh, why uh, uh, it costs a little more. In fact, Al Gore uses 17 times more electricity than the average American. The average American uses 11,256 kilowatts annually, while the Gores use an almost unbelievable 191,000 kilowatts. Yet Al Gore casually justifies this because he uses green energy that only the rich can afford. That kind of hypocrisy is not confined to the Gores. Actor John Travolta also claims that we should all sacrifice in order that we reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Yet he owns five airplanes that he can use to jet around the world, all parked within walking distance of his home in Florida. Listen to what the author of State of Fear and movie producer Michael Crichton says about this hypocrisy during the March 2007 Intelligence Squared debate. Actually, all anybody really wants to do is talk about it. They don't actually do anything. And the evidence for that is the number of major leaders in climate who clearly have no intention of changing their lifestyle, reducing their own consumption, or getting off private jets themselves. If they're not willing to do it, why should anybody else? Let's have the NRDC, the, the Sierra Club, and Greenpeace make it a rule that all of, their, all of their members cannot fly on private jets, they must get their houses off the grid, they must live in the way that they're telling everyone else to live. And if they won't do that, why should we? And why should we take them seriously? Whether we move left or right or center, the destiny of our country ought to be determined by Americans. And to see our own leaders surrendering that sovereignty to global institution it seems to me it really approaches a sellout and a betrayal of the Founding Fathers and of the idea for which America was founded. What you have seen in this video is only a small part of the evidence that the current warming of the Earth is natural. We hope this evidence has helped you understand both sides of this critical issue. We hope you ask yourself why the global warming alarmists try to convince you that the ice core data shows that carbon dioxide levels have controlled the Earth temperature in the past when most of the time temperature preceded the carbon dioxide levels, or why the troposphere is not warming according to what the carbon dioxide warming theory states it must. Then ask yourself why there is not a good correlation between carbon dioxide levels and the temperature when there is very good correlation between solar or cosmic radiation levels and temperature. Finally, ask yourself why you are never told that much higher levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide could provide a huge benefit to people in the Earth's environment. On the other hand, there is strong evidence that an elite is using global warming as one of the many tools to impose global governance in the United States and around the world. If successful, this agenda promises to bring wealth and power to a global elite and transnational corporations at a terrible expense to the average person, just like you. We ask that you think hard on the choices that this nation will be making in the near future, and then contact your senator and congressman to let them know what you believe is the right thing to do.
global warming or global governance. That one world government is being formed right now and the reason is because we are not Christian enough to stop it. Why would we want to obey man rather than God? I don't know. But the Bible teaches that we ought to obey God rather than man. If we would be true Christians, we would obey God rather than man, and we would get rid of these evil people that's destroying our Christianity here in America, and we would stop that one world government. But I don't believe it's going to happen because we are not Christian enough to stop it. Let's pray I'm wrong. Until next time, may all your sunsets set right and may the good Lord bless you both day and night.